For most of her life, actress Malobran protected herself by concealing the truth about her parentage, claiming that she had been born in Tasmania, Australia, and that her birth records had been destroyed in a fire. But this was a lie. Born in 1911, Estelle Mull O'Brien Thompson was raised as the daughter of Arthur Terence O'Brien Thompson, a Welsh mechanical engineer from Darlington who worked in Indian railways, and died in 1914 in World War I along with millions of Europeans, and his wife, Charlotte Selby, a burger from Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Charlotte's full name was Constance Charlotte Thompson, according to her 1937 obituary. According to Mull's birth certificate, her biological mother was named Constance Thompson, so it's unclear whether Mull's mother was Charlotte's then 12-year-old daughter, Constance Selby, or Charlotte. A theory that has circulated is that Constance became pregnant as a result of rape by her stepfather, Arthur Thompson. To avoid scandal, Charlotte raised Mull as Constance's half-sister. In their 1983 biography of Oberon, Charles Hyam and Roy Mosley also wrote that the daughter Selby had Maori ancestry, though the Iwi, a Maori tribe, was not known. However, Oberon considered Charlotte to be her mother. In 1949, Oberon commissioned paintings of Charlotte based on an old photograph, but depicting Charlotte with lighter skin, which hung in all her homes until Oberon's own death in 1979. The issue of her birthplace continued Murrell's entire life. She was teased by Indian students for her mixed race while she was a charity student in La Martiniere, Calcutta for girls. Oberon arrived in England for the first time in 1928, aged 17, after living in the Bombay slums while her mother stayed behind in India. She worked as a club hostess under the name Queenie O'Brien and played in minor and unbilled roles in various films. I couldn't dance or sing or write or paint. The only possible opening seemed to be in some line in which I could use my face. This was, in fact, no better than a hundred other faces, but it did possess a fortunately photogenic quality, she told a journalist at Film Weekly in 1939. Due to the use of skin lightening creams, her face was scarred, and the use of black and white photography as well as shadows helped. She would paint later in life. The nickname Queenie appears to have stuck as it was the name of her biography, written by her stepson Michael Corder. Her film career received a major boost when director Alexander Corder, 18 years her senior, took an interest and gave her a small but prominent role under the name Malobran as Anne Boleyn in Henry VIII, 1933, opposite Charles Lawton. Corder established his own film company, London Films, in 1932 and was eager to create a solid company of actors. Films, then as now, were used as propaganda pieces and rousing wartime speeches on the screen became the norm during World War II. Henry VIII became a major success and she was then given leading roles for other producers, starting with The Battle, 1934, opposite Charles Boyer, and The Broken Melody, 1934. Oberon then made two more films for Corder, The Private Life of Don Juan, 1934 with Douglas Fairbanks was a disappointment but the Scarlet Pimpernel, 1934, with Leslie Howard, who became her lover for a while, was a huge hit. Corder had been divorced from his first wife since 1930. Oberon and Corder married in 1939, but she cheated on him with Richard Hillary in 1941, an RAF fighter pilot who had been badly burned in the Battle of Britain. They likely bonded over their skin ailments. They met while he was on a goodwill tour of the United States. He later wrote the best-selling autobiography, The Last Enemy. Oberon had an on-again, off-again affair with actor John Wayne from 1938 to 1947. Oberon became Lady Corder when her husband was knighted in 1942 by George VI for his contribution to the war effort. At the time, the couple was based at Hill's house in Denham, England. She divorced him in 1945 to marry cinematographer Lucien Ballard, three years her senior as the two had met on the set of the 1944 film, The Lodger. Ballard divorced his first wife that same year after 16 years of marriage. Ballard devised a special camera light for Oberon to obscure on film her facial scars suffered in a 1937 automotive accident. The light became known as the Lobby. Ballard's mother Ada was Cherokee and Lucian is listed on the Doors rolls as 1 16th Cherokee by blood. So he and Oberon likely bonded over their mixed heritage. 
She dipped into commercial sponsorship, becoming the face of Maybelline in 1944. She and Bala divorced in 1949. Oberon married Italian-born industrialist Bruno Pagliai in 1957, adopted two children, Francesco and Bruno Jr., with him and lived in Cuenavaca, Morelos, Mexico. Unfortunately, her stepson Bruno would die in 1984, just five years after she did. In 1973, Oberon met then 36-year-old Dutch actor Robert Walders while they filmed Interval. Oberon divorced Pallia and married Walders, who was 25 years her junior, in 1975. Oberon was with Walders until her death in 1979. In 1980, Walders began his relationship with Audrey Hepburn. We were ready for each other, Walders says of their near-instant chemistry. At the time in our lives that we met, we had both made our mistakes. If chance would have had it that we would have met at an earlier stage, we might not have had the discoveries together that we did have and found those things in life together. That were valuable to us at a later point in life when we were both more mature. Walders recalls feeling that he and Hepburn were meant to be very early in their courtship. After I'd met her, a mutual friend prompted me to ask her out for dinner, but she said she had a night shoot, he explains. I thought it was her gentle way of rejecting me. The next day, she invited me for a drink at the Pierre Hotel, which turned into a three-hour talk. At one point she said, do you mind if I order some pasta? After many long phone conversations, we realized we were meant to be together. She asked me if she could take time to prepare her son, Luca and Andrea, her soon-to-be ex-husband. When she saw him, Andrea came over and said, you look very beautiful, you must be in love, and she said, I am. Waldus and Hepburn were together from 1980 until her death in 1993. When asked why he never proposed, Walder says that they never felt the need. In 1978, the year before her death, Oberon agreed to visit Hobart, supposedly in the land of her birth, for a Lord Mayoral reception. The Lord Mayor of Hobart became aware shortly before the reception that there was no proof she had been born in Tasmania, but went ahead with the celebration to avoid embarrassment. Shortly after arriving at the reception, Oberon, to the disappointment of many, denied she had been born in Tasmania. She then excused herself claiming illness and was unavailable to answer questions about her background. On the way to the reception, she had told her driver that as a child she was on a ship with her father, who became ill when it was passing Hobart. They were taken ashore so he could be treated, thereby spending some of her early years on the island. During her Hobart stay, she remained in her hotel, gave no other interviews, and did not visit the theatre named in her honour. Let's look at the emerald scene when Oberon was in Hollywood to get an idea of her love of emeralds. In England in 1922, Princess Mary appeared in public wearing an emerald engagement ring, and the price of emerald soared, sealing the gem status as a favourite among the stylish in society long before the term. Alternative bridal rings was coined. Over a decade later, her brother, Edward Prince of Wales, abdicated his throne for Wallace Simpson and proposed to her with a Cartier-designed emerald engagement ring, which she eventually updated to meet the changing times, but kept the original shank with the sentimental inscription, We are ours now, 27 by 36. Then in the 1950s, another style icon received an emerald engagement ring. Jacqueline Bouvier was proposed to by John F., Kennedy, with a Van Cleef and Arpels 2.79 carat cut emerald mounted next to a 2.8 for carat diamond, accented with tapered baguettes. In 1962, Jackie Kennedy had the ring reset with additional diamonds to reflect more modern times, just as the Duchess of Windsor did before her. Emeralds remain popular due to their being the May birthstone and just being beautiful stones. Noel Oberon, another major jewellery collector, owned spectacular jewels, many of which she wore in her films. The story behind Oberon's acquisition of a Cartier 1938 necklace would make for an interesting scene in a movie itself. Oberon had seen the emerald and diamond necklace with its flexible chain and diamond rondelle spacers, and 29 graduated suspended emerald cabochons in a store in Paris. The shop assistant told Oberon that the jewels had another admirer, apparently the designer Elsa Schiaparelli, but Oberon thought was merely a ploy to pressure her into buying it. Later that day she passed by the store again only to see that the necklace was gone. 
She told Corder, her husband at the time, the story, and he went back to the shop a few days later, found that it had not been sold, and bought it for her on the spot. Oberon wore the necklace in the 1963 film of Love and Desire. I believe it was last displayed at the Denver Art Museum. One of the very first pieces she acquired by gift from Corder was an old necklace in diamonds and emeralds. That apparently was a gift from Napoleon III to the Baroness Hossmann. It said that was Napoleon's way to thank her for the role of her husband in the new and more modern Paris. Thanks to the alterations made in Paris, this city became in just two decades into the most modern capital in the world. Moll worn the piece in movies like The Divorce of Lady X and of Love and Desire. Later Moll Oberon removed two tears to the necklace in order to make them earrings. Oberon would star with Laurence Olivier not only in The Divorce of Lady X, but also in Wuthering Heights 1939, where she played Cathy very well, her own inner conflict translating well in the Bronte character. You can learn more about the Brontes on this channel. In 1939, after her marriage, Corda got her one of the most famous pieces in her collection, a Cartier's piece made with three flowered-formed brooches. The one in the middle, the biggest one, has a charming detail on it. The pistils are diamonds with some movement which adds beauty to the whole piece. These brooches were originally designed to be worn as hair clips, but Moll preferred to let them be brooches or even cameos. After she died, the three pieces were sold separately and may have been bought by the British royal family. A few years after Oberon passed in 1979, Princess Elizabeth of England would get a special wedding gift from the Prince Philip of Greece, a tiara with three identical flower-formed clips designed by Cartier. Elizabeth II removed them to wear them separately and she did so in many occasions. Were these Oberons? The most amazing piece within her collection is the Necklace of Diamonds and 29 emeralds from the Baroque that Corda gave her in 1939. It is the most photographed necklace in the world. The piece fitted her very nicely due to her exotic beauty. The necklace has a very original design for the time, especially because of the sensual and elegant form the emeralds are linked. Mutley enjoyed that necklace until she died.